Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us. Let us begin today with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would keep us living in the positions you placed us. We pray that you would lead us uh, to the place in life that you plan for us and use us daily to fulfill your will for your glory. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Uh, our text for today, again, is found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. English Standard Version is what I'm reading. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 through 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it? that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, last week, hopefully you remember, uh, we left off dealing with our position in Christ. Uh, and uh, we read uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 two through 6, but today I'm only reading verse 6 for a reminder. It says, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Last week we mentioned that when Christ returns, we shall share in his exaltation. Colossians chapter three, verse four says, when Christ who is uh, your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When God raised Jesus from the dead, he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rules and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named, Jesus' name is above. And he puts all things in, in subjection under his feet, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. Now, this means that positionally, each child of God is privileged to sit far above all of our enemies. Where a man sits determines how much authority he may exercise. Even as a pastor, I work at not sitting in a seat or acting in authority in any other man's house out of respect. The man who sits in the general manager's chair has restricted authority. And the man who sits in the vice president's chair exercises more authority or control. But the man behind the desk marked president exercise the most authority. No matter where he may be in the factory or office, he is respected and obeyed because of where he sits. His power is determined by his position, not by his personal appearance or the way he feels. So, with a child of God, our authority is determined by our position in Christ. Let me say that again. Somebody more than me needs to hear that statement and apply it in our Christian walk. With a child of God, our authority is determined by our position in Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. Got to be willing to suffer with him to be glorified with him. Now, when we trust Jesus, we are identified with him by the Holy Spirit and made a member of his body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and 13 uh, says, For as the body is one, 
and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being made uh, are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13 says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Our old life has been buried and we have been raised to a new life of glory and victory. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 says, therefore, if any man or woman or boy or girl be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Galatians uh, chapter 6 verse 15 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Being a new creature matters. It indicates our position in Christ. In Christ we are sitting on on the very throne of the universe. So the question now is, are we living beneath our position? Or perhaps we are still in the learning stage of how to live victoriously in high positions. There was a Civil War veteran uh, who used to go from place to place begging for a place to sleep and a bite to eat and always talking about his friend, Mr. Lincoln. Because of his injuries, he was not able to hold a steady job. But as long as he could keep on going, he would talk about his beloved president, Lincoln. So one day a guy said, you say you knew Mr. Lincoln? A skeptical uh, bystander responded, uh, he says, I'm not sh uh, sure you did. Prove it. And the old man replied, why, sure, I can prove it. In fact, I have a piece of paper here that Mr. Lincoln himself signed and gave to me. From his old wallet, the man took out a much folded piece of paper and showed it to the man. He says to him, I'm not much at reading, and I apologize for that, but I know that that's Lincoln's signature. And then so the spectator asks, man, do you know what you have here? You have a generous federal pension authorized by President Lincoln. You don't have to walk around like a poor beggar. Mr. Lincoln has made you rich. He's given him a, 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 a very good pension. To paraphrase what John wrote, you Christians do not have to walk around defeated because Jesus Christ has made you victors. He has defeated every enemy and you share in the victory. Now, by faith, claim your victory. Just as the man needed to go and claim his uh, pension, his retirement. The key, of course, is faith. But this has always been God's key to victory. Faith. The great men and women named in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 all won their victories by faith. They simply took God at his word and acted on it. And he honored their faith and gave them victory. Faith is not simply saying that what God says is true. True faith is acting on what God says because it is true. Someone has once said that faith is not so much believing in spite of evidence, 
but obeying in spite of consequences. Victorious faith is the result of maturing love. The better we come to know and to love Jesus Christ, the easier it is to trust him with the needs and the battles of our lives. It's important that our maturing love become a regular and useful thing in our daily lives. If you don't use it, you might lose it. How does a believer go about experiencing this kind of love and the blessings that flow from it? To begin with, this kind of love is cultivated. It's not the result of a hit or miss friendship. A previous study pointed out that a, a believer slips back into the world by stages. First stage is friendship with the world, according to James chapter 4, verse 4. Second one is spotted by the world, according to James chapter 1, verse 27. And then loving the world, as uh, we're taught in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. And number four, conformed to the world based upon the statement Paul makes in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Our relationship to Jesus Christ is a similar way, uh, grows by stages. We must cultivate friendship with Christ. Abraham, for instance, was a friend of God, according to James chapter 2, verse 23 because he separated himself from the world and did what God told him. In order to exercise faith and cultivate our love for God, we must put our faith into action. Abraham's uh, life was not perfect, but when he sinned, he confessed and went right back to walking with God. This friendship that Abraham had with God will, and, and, and works through us also will begin to influence our lives. As we read the word and pray, and as we fellowship with God's people, Christian grace will start to show up in us. Our thoughts will be cleaner. Our conversations more meaningful and our, our desires will be more wholesome. But we must not be, uh, we will not be suddenly and totally changed. It will be a gradual process. Our friendship with Jesus and our becoming like him will lead to a deeper love for him. On the human level, friendship often leads to love. On the divine level, friendship with Christ ought to lead to love. We love him because he first loved us. And the word of God reveals his love to us. And the indwelling spirit of God makes this love more and more real to us. The Holy Spirit sheds abroad in our hearts daily the great love that God has for us. And furthermore, this love is worked out in our lives in daily obedience. Christian love is not a passing emotion. It's a permanent devotion, a deep desire to please Christ and to do his will. The more we know him, the better we love him. And the better we love him, the more we become like him, conformed to the image of the Son. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, of course, we will not be completely changed to the 
uh, uh, way God wants us to be until Jesus returns and we see him as he is. But we are to begin the process right now. What an exciting way to live. As God's love is perfected in us, we have confidence towards him and do not live in fear because we because fear is cast out and we can be honest and open there is no need to pretend in us and because fear is gone our obedience to his command is born out of love and not fear or terror we discover that his commandments are not burdensome. And finally, living in this atmosphere of love, honesty, and joyful obedience, we are able to face the world with victorious faith and to overcome instead of being overcome. The place to begin is not in some daring, dramatic experience. The place to begin is in the quiet, personal place of prayer. Peter wanted to give his life for Jesus, but when he was asked to pray, Peter went to sleep. A believer who begins the day reading the word of God and meditating on it and worshiping Christ in prayer and praise will experience this perfecting love. And I must remind us that when we are not trying to live right according to God's will, we won't have to deal with Satan much at all. He just lets us go when we're not trying to please God. But when we try to live according to God's will, then Satan will get busy trying to stop us, especially when we are seeking to yield and not grieve the Holy Spirit when we are allowing him to lead us. When we began to experience the maturing love, we will know it and everybody else will know it. Our lives will be marked by confidence and honesty joyful obedience, and victory. It's the same way. One Friday on a hill called Calvary, Jesus died in victory. And early the third day morning, he rose in victory. In other words, whatever direction our lives take, we will be able to live in victory. If we're down, we're down victoriously. And if we're up, we're up victoriously. Just like Jesus died, he rose. So that's all I've got for today. That's uh, uh, perfected love. Uh, gives us an attitude of victory, of victory, of victory. And this was part two. I hope you are blessed by it. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your patience and long-suffering with us as you perfect us and as you perfect your love in us individually and collectively day by day. Help us to walk before you and among all mankind in a way that shows that we are maturing. In Jesus' powerful and wonderful name, we pray. Amen. Don't forget to mask up, practice social distancing, and wash your hands often. And when you can, get the vaccine. And I must say, uh, from what I can tell, Mount Sinai, you're doing a wonderful job at getting the vaccine. And I appreciate it. It makes my job, it makes the Holy Spirit job not burdensome. Uh, so let's do what we have to do so that we can do what we want to do. I like that. 
let's do what we have to do so that we can do what we want to do. That's all right. Uh, Kenny Rogers had a song, when you're hot, you're hot, when you're not, you're not. That was a good saying. Uh, let's do what we got to do so that we can do what we want to do. And with that, I'm out of here. Take care and may the Lord bless you in a wonderful, victorious way. Bye-bye.